Good evening, everyone. My name is Megan Bernard, and I am the Director of Membership here at the MFA. Uh, before we get started, a few housekeeping items. I wanted to let you know that we do have a closed caption option for all. All you have to do is simply click show captions um, at the bottom of your screen. Additionally, we'll have um, a question and answer portion of the evening uh, at the conclusion of the talk. All you have to do is uh, click the Q&A button um, anytime throughout the talk, and we'll be sure to get to as many questions as we can. I'd like to thank you all this evening for being with us. Tonight is special as I get to introduce not just a colleague, but a friend, Ethan Lasser, the John Moore's Cabot Chair of Art of Americas and one of the curators of Hear Me Now, the Black Potters of Old Edgefield, South Carolina, on view in our Torf Gallery right behind the Huntington entrance uh, through July 9th. Whether talking with Dave Potter's descendants, Dave the Potter's descendants, to the Edgefield community itself, to the MFA staff working group, to outside voices from our Boston community through the Table of Voices, Ethan and his team have ensured that this exhibition is objects and the people touched by it and were cared for, respected, and included. Included in the narrative, included in the space, included in a story that needed to be told. I would invite you all to visit the gallery if you have not done so already to be within its walls, surrounded by these objects made so intentionally, they are a true message from the past and it's an experience that should not be missed. I'd be remiss if I did not thank all of our members, our most dedicated audience for your support. You make an indelible mark on our MFA. We would not be the museum we are without you. Now from the comfort of your own home and mine, I virtually invite you into our TORF gallery. Thank you, Megan. Uh wonderful introduction uh, and uh, heartfelt words. Thank you from an old friend and thrilled to see everyone here. I don't exactly know who's out there, but uh, glad to speak uh, with you. And really, I see this uh, talk as an invitation. If you've seen the exhibition or uh, if you are planning a visit, um, this will serve as something of a primer, but it is no substitute for coming to see the works of these artists in person uh, and um, you have more time, you have through July 9th. So uh, not too much time, but enough for more, more than one visit. Um, the project is a collaboration with the Metropolitan Museum where the show opened uh, in the fall. And after it closes in Boston, it goes to Michigan where my co-curator Jason Young, who you see in the photograph uh, teaches. And that uh, at left is Adrian Spinozzi, my co-curator from the Met. And then the show ends, um, a show about the South, a show that tells a Southern story. We felt it was really important um, for the show to conclude in the South. So it goes to the High Museum in Atlanta to round out the tour. And I wanna emphasize um, by way of this image of my co-curators and by way of an, another image of uh, uh, almost like a, a, a role of acknowledgements here of the many people um, who helped to shape and lent their voices to this project along the way. And that's still happening. Uh, this is a slide of me and my um, co-curators at the uh, Springfield Baptist Church in Edgefield, South Carolina, where we had just given a talk like this one. Uh, Springfield was the place where uh, Dave and the potters that I'll be introducing tonight worshiped. And you're seeing here the clergy of that church and uh, some local historians who helped us on the project. And by way of introduction, I'd also call attention to the participants, the historians, the artists, the potters, archeologists, who are on our audio guide, which you should listen to when you go see the show. Uh, their words have um, brought uh, many of the objects in the exhibition to life. Um, and here you're seeing uh, some of the participants in that part of the, that side of the exhibition. And one last slide by way of introduction, by way of acknowledgement, um, by way of uh, sharing um, some of the important people who shaped the project here in Boston through our Table of Voices program, where um, the MFA invites and engages uh, local stakeholders, artists, professors, historians, a minister to share uh, their insights. Um, in this case, we came to them and asked, how can we make this project these Southern uh, pieces of stoneware important and relevant um, for artists in Boston. And I think 
you'll see their answer uh, in the way they have shaped uh, the design when you visit the show. But a tip of a hat to this group, I don't know if anyone's out there, but um, they were uh, very much authors of the project too. So what are we, what are we uh, bringing um, to Boston here? Well, there are 60 ceramic objects, many of which have never left South Carolina. Uh, and they represent a cross section of um, vessels, mostly storage vessels made by enslaved artisans in the small region of Edgefield, South Carolina. And here's a selection of objects from the show. I'll talk about some of these in more detail, uh, but you see stoneware storage vessels, you see face jugs, those objects with eyes and teeth. And I want to emphasize that many of us um, learned about the history of slavery through agriculture, right? We, we, we know about cotton, we know about tobacco, we know about the growing of rice. But this is a story of uh, what historians call industrial slavery, where enslaved people were really leading um, working in leading factory, small factories. And there were 24, two dozen uh, sites um, in Edgefield where pots were being made and some hundred, about 150 people involved in, in their production. Here's where our story uh, takes shape. This is um, at right, the small town of Edgefield, South Carolina, it's still there. Uh, and it is um, located, as you can see, on very close to the banks of the Savannah River. And that's important because there are three reasons this industry um, really takes shape here uh, in small rural Edgefield. One is clay. And uh, here I'm showing you a picture. We, the curatorial team, my colleagues and I made some five trips down to Edgefield. And uh, here we are digging clay in a creek uh, at one of the potteries. And um, this was in 2022. So clay is very much still there. And one of the reasons this all starts up is because of the large deposits of clay in the uh, banks of the Savannah River. That's one. Two, if I go back to my map here, as of 1833, there's a railroad. And the railroad can from Edgefield to the coast, uh, to Charleston, you see the yellow star at lower right, uh, and to Columbia, the capital, one of the earliest railroads in uh, the US, and that moved pots to distant markets. So I, it's important to say that um, the pottery in Edgefield is being sold across South Carolina, across Georgia, across North Carolina, and the railroad is part of that. And of course, the third reason this all happens here uh, is, um, and this is what our project really uh, looks at in some detail are the makers, are the generations of enslaved people who not only supported this industry, but led it with their skill, with their uh, understanding of materials uh, at every turn from the 1820s to the 1860s. Of course, pots have been being made in um, Edgefield in the uh, banks of the Augusta River for generations. So the earliest object in the show is this one, not uh, a stoneware pot from uh, the 19th century, but a, a Native American object um, made by a Catawba potter around 1500, made from the same clays that would be um, used later on. But people have been making clay in this region really for centuries. In 1820, though, is when our story begins. 1820 is when uh, capitalists coming from the North see an opportunity to profit from natural resources from, from enslaved people uh, and begin to start small potteries. And the reason it's important here, you can see one of, one of many dated objects in the exhibition, July 29th, 1820, one of the earliest uh, objects in the show and one of the earliest objects we associate with Edgefield pottery. Why do you need so many, why do you need pottery is maybe the question to open with. And um, the answer rests here in a section of the show about cooking. And Edgefield pots were ubiquitous because of course we're in a period before refrigerators, right? You could think of these objects, some of you are probably having dinner or cooking right now. And uh, you know, I, I, I would um, wonder if there's a piece of Tupperware out there. And I say that because really these are, you can imagine these as the Tupperware of their time. They held grain and molasses and butter. 
uh, and meat, as we'll see, they were in white kitchens and black kitchens and in slave kitchens and in the kitchens of, of, of free people. And as the population in South Carolina grows largely um, through cotton plantations, right? More and more people are uh, growing cotton. You need more and more pots because you have more and more people to feed and more and more food. And you'll see as you um, go, as I go through this talk and as you visit the show, that a number of the objects have numbers on them. Three here, three uh, on upper left on this big molasses jug, Southern make. And the numbers are important because they get us into the mindset of the maker, a mindset for which uh, volume was um, the logic of everything. So these are three representing three gallons. And uh, we'll see some objects that are 28 gallons. But if you were a potter in Edgefield, everything was about um, capacity. You were being asked to make uh, pots of a certain volume. They were sold by the gallon, 12 cents a gallon. Uh, and they're often ornamented that way as well. Our story though in the show, here's our opening wall, is not a story of users, but rather a story of makers. And we really wanted to bring attention, hear me now, the me are the black potters of old Edgefield uh, who haven't really been part of the story with a few exceptions of this material until now. And we wanted to foreground their contribution to this industry and to American art more generally. To do that, one of the ways we've done that is tried to find as many names as we can, uh, looking at archives, looking at census documents, at ledger books. And we found about 150 people involved in this industry across 24 potteries across some uh, 45 years. You'll see men's names and women's names. Um, you'll see in a couple cases, a profession, a role, you know, potter, wagon driver. Uh, and um, there are 100, as I say, 150 names, and they open the exhibition. They're the first things you see. Uh, and you can hear them too, because their names, the, these names are recited. We can think of the scale of this industry in terms of the 150 people working. Surely there were more. But we can also think about it in terms of the thousands, yes, thousands of pots coming out of Edgefield year after year from about 1820 to 1865. And if you know your American history, you'll understand that hard end date, right? Because as soon as emancipation happens, as soon as uh, the slave system ends, um, the whole thing collapses. It's entirely contingent on enslaved labor, the knowledge, the skill. This is a, um, an object that is uh, one of the opening pieces in the show. And it's a fragment. It's, a, it's what we call a sherd, uh, the bottom of a the broken bottom of a jar. So if you we're actually looking at the base of something. And what I call you, your attention to there in the center is a big handprint. And that handprint has become um, very meaningful, I think, uh, to audiences coming to the exhibition because it is at once um, a mark of an author, of a maker. And part of the violence of this story, part of the violence of enslavement is that those names, with one exception, which we'll talk about, never get to sign their work, right? The names we see on pots coming out of Edgefield are the enslavers' names, not the names of the maker. So this hand is a mark of authorship. Two, it is, um, I think something that, a, a mark that calls attention to what's so special about this story, namely that we think of slavery, as I said, in terms of cotton that goes threadbare, of sugar that's consumed, rice that's eaten, tobacco that gets smoked. But these objects offer us a direct link to the hand, to the world of enslaved people that shaped everything around us, you uh, can argue, but these are unequivocal, right? traces um, to those people and to their stories. And that, where do we get a bottom of a jug? Well, I, want, I just wanna show you, and I, I include this photo um, from one of our research trips where you see the artist Bumi Gadebo, who we'll talk about, a contributor to the show, standing in a pile, what's called a waster pile. So at the bottom of a kiln, these were wood-fired kilns, 
any potters out there will appreciate the challenge of um, not using gas or electricity, but wood. And you almost inevitably lose 20% of your pots. There's a high failure rate. And as the kiln would be unloaded, you just throw the broken pots into a big pile. And this is that pile. Uh, this is the remnant. And we've seen several of these waster piles in Edgefield today of that place. Here, another image. It was like, um, to go to these places was like walking uh, in snow or walking, um, as my colleague Jason said, on bones, on the bones of the people who made these pots. And that handprint emerged from one such pile. It was amazing to encounter those places and to think about the objects that came out of them that still survive. So here I'm taking you to the center of the exhibition and really to the star of our story and to the artists who um, personally I became acquainted with this story through. And that's the potter who signed his work, Dave, who later takes the name David Drake. A potter responsible not for the three gallon pieces that we've seen, but for 28 gallon, astonishing, right? 28 gallon pots, not for molasses or grain, but for the storage of salted meats, pork and beef. And here I want to put this in context to say that if you lived on a big cotton plantation, so Frederick Douglass or Harry Jacobs tell us, once a week on Monday nights, uh, there would be uh, an event called Allowance Day. And people from across a plantation would come to one place to receive their rations of meat for the week. And this was that place, this pot was that place, these big pots were those places, 28 gallons, 100 pounds, you can't move them, people come to them. So imagine the life around these objects. But we know Dave because he signed his pots between 1834, we have his earliest example in this show. Here it is. Through the latest example we have is 1866, astonishing, 32 years. And what he did is not just put his name and as you can see the date, I'm gonna go zoom in here for a detail of the inscription on the shoulder of this pot. So first I call your, your, your attention to that date, 12th June, 1834. Astonishing for someone in my shoes to have that kind of date, like painters sometimes put the year on their painting, but to have month, day, year, and to have that across a body of work for some 30 years is very, uh, very special. But then you see this word, this word inscribed in cursive concatenation, a word that um, today registers for uh, maybe some of you who are uh, computer scientists out there, Excel spreadsheet types, because you can concatenate lines of code, you can link together lines of code. But of course, that wasn't the story in 1834. In 1834, this was a poet's word, appropriately, as you'll see. And it was a word about linking stanzas together through rhyme, taking separate parts and putting them together. And that's our opening word of our enslaved potter, Dave, the first of some 45 uh, what become poems and verses that he inscribes on his pots. Here's another example of a Dave pot with a date and his name inscribed in cursive. And we could say a lot about what cursive means in this period and the uh, which suggests education. And here are some of the other Dave pots in the exhibition. Uh, we have, um, uh, I think, 12 of his great jars uh, around the show. Here's one of the giant Dave pots. And with a poem, one of the, as I say, he moves from single words to verses. So by 1859, uh, he's a good for lard or holding fresh meats, right? We've talked about that. Blessed we were when Peter saw the folded sheets. Like any good writer, Dave is also a reader, and he's uh, here referring to a biblical story um, that some of you may know. But I want to put this in a context for you and give you a sense of what does it mean to be an enslaved potter writing on pots in South Carolina in the 19th century. And we have to go back, actually, to 1834. If you remember your uh, American history, you remember Nat Turner's Rebellion, which was an uprising of enslaved people um, against their enslavers. People were killed. It was, a, a for the white people of South Carolina, a terrifying event. And their response was to 
clamp down on literacy. So there are laws in the books. The same year, the, the poem, uh, the, the pot concatenation is June 1834. By December 1834, South Carolina has strengthened its anti-literacy laws, making it a punishable offense, a crime for uh, enslaved people to read and write. And in the face of that, and for the next um, decades, Davis flaunting his literacy, putting it on these immobile, monumental objects. And we can talk about what that's about. We don't really know how or why. Um, uh, he's the only po he's the only potter doing this, but we have to understand these in that context. Sometimes the poems are more poignant, harder to absorb. So here's one from 1857, August 16th, 1857, when Dave, speaking in the first person, asks a heartbreaking question: "I wonder where is all my relation, friendship to all in every nation." Heartbreaking because from what we are understanding, that was the summer that his own family was auctioned away and he lost his family. Much of his work and his life is about trying to recover those relationships. Here, another one from that same summer, actually from a week later, August 22nd, 1857. And part of the power of seeing these pots together is uh, an understanding that they haven't been together since they came out of the kiln in August 1857, and now they're back together at the MFA uh, this summer. I made another first person. I made this jar for cash, though it's called lucre trash. And we we can only imagine that one. Um, I mean, Dave is a he's a very ambiguous writer, but no no evidence that he was being paid right as an enslaved person. The cash went to someone else. Thus, it can be dismissed as. Trash and filthy lucre is another biblical riff. <clears throat> what we know about uh, Dave, I'm, I don't expect you to read this, but I'll just point out some of the images on this timeline to flesh out the life of this uh, potter, of this artist a bit more. You'll see on the left side, a newspaper. That newspaper is the Edgefield Hive. In the Edgefield, and, and people wonder like, how did Dave gain literacy? How did he learn? how to read, right? We know the stories of Frederick Douglass who tricked his, uh, the, the kids who were his, the white kids who were his, his age into teaching him to read. Well, Dave's first owner, first enslaver owned a newspaper and it wasn't uncommon for enslaved people to lay type. So we wonder if that was um, part of the story of this artist's literacy. And then I show you on, um, there's two documents here. You can't read them, but I'll just point out when you come to the show, you'll see uh, some of the primary sources that we know that we can understand Dave through. So a bill of sale, some sources hard to see where he is actually sold from one person to another. And that, on a happier note, uh, the moment in 1868 when he registers to vote, taking the name on the steps of the Edgefield Courthouse, David Drake, Drake being his first enslaver. The show also includes a number of works by contemporary artists who have uh, gotten into this story. So we, we didn't call a bunch of artist friends and say, hey, we, wanna, we want you to respond. Rather, we met these fellow travelers who were researching the history of Edgefield on their own, like the Astor Gates, who has a piece in the show, uh, arranging the poems, the Dave poems to music. And then he has choirs performing them. It's a very moving film in the exhibition. Or an artist who I mentioned, who you saw her picture in the great pile, the waster pile, uh, Bumi Gadebo, who uh, makes contributes these two works, also made of clay. And I'll tell you a story about um, this clay because uh, it comes from um, the True Blue plantation where Bumi's own ancestors were enslaved. And she digs clay from the burial ground of her ancestors. You can see a tombstone being raised at left and makes clay vessels out of that material. Making us wonder, as she said the other day when she was here in Boston at the museum, what the sand remembers, making us wonder what the sand remembers, what is the joy and the tears and the blood in the soil and how can vessels like these made from that soil 
commemorate her own family. And of course, for me as a historian, when I think about these objects, it makes me think, makes me wonder about the Edgefield potters and their own experience of the material. What did Dave, in other words, think about the soil he was working? I'll pause for a minute because I know it's a lot to take in, but there's another, there's one more chapter to this story, uh, which I'll share. I'm, I'm already seeing some questions, so I'm making, I will make sure we save some time to get to those. The next chapter of the story is uh, concerns these objects, face vessels. And everything we've talked about so far was made for the market, right? It was made to be sold, not to the profit of the makers, but to the profit of their enslavers. These objects, by contrast, handheld objects, small scale objects, were made by the potters for themselves. And we can imagine them almost secreted away in the kiln. And they're called face vessels. And you'll see they are uh, molasses jugs, a common edge field form with eyes and teeth. <clears throat> we found about 180 in our research. And with that, and this bulletin board is growing, which is cool. It's uh, We've learned about more of these objects as our um, show has been open and as uh, these Edgefield stories getting more publicity. Where we found a lot of them, many of them have descended in uh, families from Edgefield, the descendants of enslaved people, moved north during the Great Migration. So what are these objects? Well, here they are in the exhibition. And here I'll, I'll show one up close. And it's a question that we're only beginning to answer. And our beginning, uh, we're, we're, we're beginning to answer first by dismissing um, the longstanding account of these as whiskey bottles or flasks, uh, which people in, South, people in South Carolina have been telling that story for a long time. But in fact, we know they're not glazed on the inside, so they couldn't hold liquid, they were porous. Instead, we want to approach their meaning and significance by thinking about the material. We've taught, we, I showed a slide earlier of Edgefield clay, of stoneware clay, and we talked about wood firing. I could tell you about glaze, alkaline glaze too. But these objects have two materials. They have that stoneware body, but then a white clay for the eyes and teeth. And that white clay is what I'm showing you at left. It's called kaolin clay. And we were uh, surprised to drive um, along the highway in Edgefield and to see on the side of the road, a huge pile of Kaolin. Kaolin is also a local material, older geologically than uh, the stoneware. A local material, but also a local material in West Africa, the place from which many of the enslaved people uh, came to Edgefield. Some, some potters were born in the U.S., but others came later and were born in Africa. And so we've started to wonder about the resonance of Kaolin in uh, African culture, and learned that it's used in connection with um, objects like this. This this power figure, this Nkisi, an African object, is in the exhibition. And Kalen could be used on the body or in association with a figure like this for uh, healing or harming, uh, for communicating between living and dead. And so it's led to uh, led us to understand. Uh, these objects as sacred objects, as religious objects, as downstream versions, as South Carolina versions of the African power figures. I can talk more about that, or you can think more about it when you're in the exhibition. What I would say is that a lot of artists, living artists, including Simone Lee, whose massive uh, face vessel you're seeing here, covered in white slip, we've talked about Kalen, covered in white slip and cowrie shells, uh, and this is a blown up version of a small, one of those small face vessels I just showed you. Someone Lee's having a moment in Boston. You may know her name because she also has a show at the ICA. And indeed, this object, the other version of this object is at the ICA. So there are two of these works called Large Jug in Boston by um, an artist who I think is probably the foremost sculptor of our time. Uh, here's another view of the piece set against that wall of face vessels. And I love the way that the artist similarly characterizes this piece by talking about how you can look in but not see in. And that is in many ways our experience of the historic objects. We can look inside, but we can't quite see, right? We don't exactly know what they're for. Here's the vessel that 
at five feet, the 10 inch vessel that Simone responded to and literally uh, blew up, amplifying the Edgefield Potters and their story. I wanna talk about um, two more parts of the exhibition uh, that um, are more recent additions. The first is that as Megan alluded to, we've been um, building our relationship with and um, we're privileged to be visited by the, the great, 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 great grandchildren. I think I have that right. Four greats of Dave, of uh, the Edgefield Potter. Um, and you can see some members of that family here and they're, uh, they participate and share their own insights in a film that's in the exhibition, which you should go see, very moving. And then I, I've also been um, heartened and uh, every day I go in to check out this response wall where visitors like you have been recording their own impressions of the show. Uh, and it is, we've at this point, thousands of cards and I just share two I saw recently um, that speak to the depth of engagement. Um, I left someone saying, it is a privilege to know your roots, to be grounded by a family's history. And of course, a reference maybe to that film I just described. At right, amazingly, in, a, in an exhibition that cues you to handwriting, right? Because Dave's poetry is much about the, pen, the issue of penmanship. So here's two different uh, writers, right? Two different hand, handwriting uh, and one person writing, how many museums um, have artwork made by my enslaved ancestors? The second person at the bottom responding, my ancestors were slave holders, not skeletons in a closet, but ghosts that walk with me every day. I had to have a moment of pause when I saw that this show had created that kind of dialogue. So I encourage you to uh, visit and to record your own responses. Lots of people have built this project, uh, individuals, organizations, grant-making organizations. And I think we have some time for some Q&A, but I'll simply end here by reminding you, uh, stick around for any Q&A, but also to invite you to come see the show uh, on view at the MFA through July 9th. So thank you and thank you, Megan. I'm happy to take some questions if you'd like. Thank you, Ethan. That was uh, just really inspiring. And it's, um, I've heard, Heard you speak about this exhibition many times and I learned something new every time. So thank you for sharing all of this with us. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, I do wanna say that um, we will put an email address in the chat for those um, questions that we aren't able to get to. Please share that with our in our membership inbox and we'll try to connect you with Ethan and his team. Um, so one of the first questions we um, received was, um, Ethan, you had mentioned that there was a hard ending, ending of the pottery in Edgefield 1865. And the question is, was there no continuation of pottery production in the region after emancipation? Uh, good question. There is some can, um, attempts uh, to continue. There's, you know, you really understand how much the enslaved people led the operation when you begin to look at the post-Civil War contracts where uh, the, the enslavers are trying to negotiate with the enslaved people um, to keep producing pottery for them. And you see uh, how little they knew, the white people knew about actually making pots. Um, most of the production that continues though happens elsewhere because we know of certain potters who move from South Carolina and go west to Louisiana, to Texas and start their own um, potteries. So not much. there's not much that happens at this scale uh, in Edgefield that dies out pretty quickly. Thank you. Um, there's a, lot, a few questions that have to do with kind of Dave's origin. Um, how did he come upon his education and where did he learn pottery? Yeah, I mean, a lot of this show is uh, built. And one of the reasons we open with these fragments is a way of saying we don't know everything. So I can only answer that question by speculating. And I would refer to the newspaper I showed, the Edgefield Hive, as a possibility of how someone learns to read and write. As, a, um, as I mentioned, his owner, his enslaver owned uh, the Edgefield Hive. And we know of other cases where enslaved people laid type. Uh, and um, how, how did, yeah, Potter, similarly with like, how did Dave become 
not just learn how to turn a pot, but become someone who could create 28 gallon, 95 pound pots. I mean, that's a very distinctive skill set as any potter on the Zoom call can uh, attest. Um, we know that certain that people were teaching each other across generations. Um, we know that there's potting traditions in Africa. Hard to know where kind of he lands though. Yeah. This is a show about uh, very fragment as as much in the history of slavery, very fragmentary archives. Thank you. Um, there's a question. I know this is something that we've talked about. Kind of why um, was Dave able to inscribe prose onto these pots without um, bringing any attention to the fact that he could read and write? Well, I think it's. I think um, he the, the attention is clear, right? They're very conspicuous. Um, so it's hard to say that no one was able to see them. Uh, I, you know, again, I don't have a real, I, my answer is only a speculative one. Um, and people actually in the period write about his poetry. So we knew that it was being read and absorbed uh, by, 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 by both black and white audiences. Um, I suppose that, you know, part of me has to assume that uh, some of his enslavers were profiting from this. But another part of me knows that there's a six year interval when he's sold to someone else and there's no poetry. So not everyone was on board with it. I would also say that when you are crafting objects like he's crafting, objects that so outpace, right? Anything around you. If we put it in simple terms, we could say that, you know, the typical Edgefield jug is three gallons and he's creating things that are 28 gallons. Like maybe you can just do whatever you want. If you if you reach a certain skill level, so those are very those are three different interpretations, and hard to know. It's probably somewhere uh, in between them all. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that we've been asked is about the uh, face pots and why. Um, this very interesting question: Why are they showing teeth, and what are they glazed with? Yeah. Um, so the kale and teeth are a very distinctive feature. They're, they're glazed the same way that the uh, big pots are glazed. So the, the part of um, Edgefield's access to natural materials was access to glaze. So you had, you're using what's called alkaline glaze, which is uh, basically liquid clay and wood ash as a vitrifying agent. So those are the same, they're glazed the same way. Um, and yeah, the teeth are very, uh, the teeth and the eyes are, are, are very distinctive and um, we associate them with these Nkisi or power figures, um, but what what other meanings they might have held? Um, some people have speculated that they're portraits. I don't really buy that because they've seen they, they they you can see the same hand uh, and you can see some pretty common features. So I don't think they're that individuated, um, but they are uh, they do feel like embodied embodied objects, and the teeth are part of that. And it's going to be our last question. Um, what happened to Dave after emancipation? And are there any other places besides the um, the places that you visited where these pots can be found? Um, after we, the last record we have is 1868. So it's that voter roll. Um, we know less about his own history. He's by that point, he's like, we think in his late sixties. Uh, and I can't, I, I don't know, that's the last trace. We do know that Edgefield becomes the violent center of a violent world of uh, post um, Civil War South Carolina, the really the center of disenfranchisement. So even as Dave is registering to vote, um, the kind of uh, Megan um, and I have talked about this, but the the Klan is beginning to organize, and it's all happening in Edgefield. Uh, disenfranchisement efforts are beginning to organize. But it's unclear kind of where he lands. As to the question of where, like, where can you, where can you see the pots? Is that the question? Where can you see other are there any other pots that are found kind of distilled on the land? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of these objects survive through um, benign neglect, meaning that you know they're not they're not part of an active um, until recently. They haven't really been actively. Um, collected or stewarded. We're grateful to the collectors who have been stewarding them. Um, 
uh, but they they're they're surely more out there, I, I think, and uh, many are still in the south. Most of the objects in the show are from the south in public and private collections. And we have a lot of work to do to go through those piles I showed and to uh, excavate them properly um, and to understand what else is there. Well, thank you. Um, again, I know we have a lot more questions coming in and I do encourage you all to um, email the membership inbox and we'll uh, be, be sure to connect you uh, with Ethan and his team. Ethan, thank you. Um, I hate that this is something that has to end, but it can continue as you either um, work your way through the um, exhibition catalog, which is available in our shop, or and or you can also visit the gallery on the Torf Gallery right behind the Huntington entrance. Uh, we hope to see many of you there. I know I've enjoyed this, this part of my evening. It's hard to call it a job when I get to uh, listen to lectures such as these. So thank you all for um, your participation tonight, and we look forward to seeing you in the galleries. Thanks, Megan. See you all soon. Thank you.